How's it going today? So, so I'm going to introduce myself. I'm not going to get moderated. Pressure on her in the back. Just kidding. So, so my name is Ryan Har. I am a wildlife biologist at the Iowa Department of Natural Resources um, and so forth. You guys, they keep asking me to come back up here and talk about fire. And I, so somebody's writing on their cards that I got to keep coming back up here. And so the truth of the matter is I do a lot of things. I can BS my way through just about anything and stuff like that. But we're going to talk a little bit about fire this morning here. Um, you know, I am a wildlife biologist. I do all sorts of things. I come up, I actually live over in north central Iowa. I come over to northeast Iowa to help with deer disease sampling. Um, but the last two years I've come over here, I've come up with a head that was infected. So they're probably going to not let me come over here much anymore. Um, Everywhere I go, I kind of, you know, we like to light stuff on fire and do these sorts of things and, and do lots of habitat improvement practices and stuff like that. So, so it gets interesting. So I have about, oh gosh, those of you who've been here in years past, this is about my seventh year up here, I think. Um, and I come back and forth and whatnot. This is probably I'm about six different talks on fire. And we can go a lot of different directions with these things. I could go to just a, a flat out basic, here's what you're doing. And that's what I do with landowners in a lot of contexts um, out in my counties and stuff that I cover. I'll actually go out, do a workshop for 15 or 20 people, and we'll really get into the nuts and bolts of it. This is what we're doing every day. Um, but I suspect you guys have probably played with fire more than the, a the average person, right? How many people have a lighter in their pocket other than me? OK. Well, you never know. You might have to go out and set something up. So, um, so we're going to talk a little, just this is, this is a little bit more of employing fire um, rather than, hey, this is what we're doing. This is what a, a rake is and a, and a flapper is and getting fire on the ground. We're going to talk a little bit more about fire and thinking about it from ecology and stuff like that. Because my sense is, is usually now I'm starting to get this group likes to think about fire more and how you're going to use it. So, so we're going to talk about employing from a small landowner's kind of a, a small landowner's primer here. So, so on a scale of one to ten, one being I hide in a brick room and cower to 10, you know, I throw the match out and sit back with a, peach, with a cup of coffee and watch the world burn. How comfortable is everybody with fire? About a seven or eight, so he's close to the cup of coffee. He's like, oh, baby. Okay, anybody else? Five, six. You're smiling. Not at all. Seven if you got people on hand. People, people make it easier, right? So, so it's, fire becomes a thing of comfort, right? It's kind of a comfort thing. And the first couple times you do it, yesterday I was actually down in, where the heck was I? I can't even, I've slept in my own bed four nights in two weeks. So I don't even, I'm not really sure where I'm at. Yesterday I was in Southeast Iowa and we're actually teaching younger, or younger professionals, we won't say students, young professionals. Um, we're actually putting them through the basic fire course, fire safety and how they get out and they do it and stuff for agencies and stuff like that. Those people are not comfortable with fire. That's new. It's like, ah, even this little fire right here is kind of a big deal to them, right? Unlike you know, that fire, which is raging across the landscape and stuff, and it's still not a very big deal. I mean, that's, that's really, that was completely contained in cave. So, so, but when we start to think about fire in, in, in today's landscapes, we really have to think about novel ecosystems. And the older I get, and I, I'm not that old yet, but I kind of, I've been around a while, we'll say that. Um, the, more, the more I do fire and stuff like that, things are driven by novel ecosystems. Does anybody have an idea what a novel ecosystem is or what I might mean by that? The ecosystems we live in today are not what was here 150 years ago, okay? And this is a good example, and this is something that we burn pretty frequently and stuff like that. That is about 400 acres of Reed's canary grass. Reed's canary grass was not here even 50 years ago, right? This is an ecosystem, it's a reed canary grass willow system that now the ecosystem has actually altered the fire regime that's gonna be here. And I'm gonna suspect a lot of you people on the, on the properties you own or the properties you burn and you manage are dealing with similar things. Bush honeysuckle invaded woodlands are not natural, okay? Multiflora rose woodlands are not natural. Um, the fun one that if we get a little bit further south, hopefully we don't see it up here a ton, um, is tall fescue. Tall fescue is antipyric. Okay, it's got properties and chemicals within it that actually keep, prevent fire from moving through the landscape. It stays green all winter long. You can't burn it. Okay, you have to burn that sucker on a very super cold winter right after it's been cured because the basal one inch of that plant stays green all year long and will not burn. Okay? Okay? <coughs> okay? So, novel ecosystems. And so, what, in a lot of cases, that drives our fire regime, right? Perhaps that ecosystem has now changed to something that shouldn't burn as much as it used to. Perhaps it's changed to something that should burn more. Maybe we have to burn it more to actually get what we really kind of want. If anybody's a pheasant hunter and stuff like that, pheasant hunters in here? 
Anybody? Anybody? One in the back. <laughs> if you've ever gone out and tried to walk through a reed canary grass field in the middle of August, what's it like? Impossible. It is just a tangled, horrible, just mess. You can't get through that stuff because your hips are going up, you're trying to get over it, it tangles your feet, right? It's also, when that stuff catches fire, that burns like gasoline. It'll burn at twice the heat that some other grasses do. And so when you burn that, look out, because it's going to flash in your face like other grasses won't, and it's going to move very quickly, and it's going to put off BTUs like nobody's business. So that novel ecosystem kind of changes the way we have to think about our fire, okay? And there, I mean, and you name it, is when you start to get an invasive species and stuff like that into that concept of invasive species, that changes fire regimes all over, okay? I personally, right, I probably shouldn't say it in a group of people who like forestry and trees and stuff like that, but I'm an anti-seedite. I hate red cedar. Red cedar is the bane of our existence and it's going to take over the world. Mark my words, it will. Okay, it's the green glacier. We don't see it coming, but it's coming. Okay, red cedar will take over the world. I challenge you all when you drive home today and you drive down the highways and byways and you're not paying any attention, watch for red cedar in the road ditches in the, in the fields. It is everywhere. Okay. Red cedar is a, to burn red cedar is actually a chemical driven fire. That is not, I just don't go light it and red cedar doesn't burn. You actually have to volatilize the cedar oils and change the chemistry of the plant to get it to burn. And when it burns, it's explosive. Okay. Okay. So, but little cedars die in fire. Big cedars don't unless you've got a fire you don't want to be around. So anyways, invasive species, they change the system, right? All right. Well, fire is and was and still can be basically the primary driver of most ecosystems. I'd say most ecosystems on Earth, but certainly most ecosystems in North America and certainly where we are, which is kind of this general red Iowa, Wisconsin, Illinois area, right? Okay, it dictates the herbaceous community that comes back, dictates the woodland communities that come back, and certainly the wildlife that are present in the area. And me as a biologist, you know, I'm considering what patterns and processes are driving wildlife. Okay. In our area, we would say that probably, and this is weird because this is all derived from dendrochronology. So these are actually tree ring fire scars and stuff like that. This is derived out of uh, the University of Missouri. They've got a fantastic lab run down there by, uh, run by Guyette and Stambaugh, or, uh, Mike Stambaugh down there. Um, but they would say that probably this, and now the context here is this is probably understory fires in our part of the world up here, this driftless area, are probably happening every uh, three to 10 years, okay? We'll talk about that versus a stand replacing fire in this next slide. So we'd say right here, how often should fire happen? Those of you who burn, how frequently do you burn? Every year? Every three or four? Stuff like that? Every five? I have a woodland landowner in southern Iowa that burns every single year. Sometimes they burn twice a year. They burn an oak forest twice a year. Okay, we know, we know them and, and you know whatever. I'd say they're completely wrong, but they have four species of ants that only occur on their farm in the entire state of Iowa. So. Maybe they're doing something right because they got all these endangered ants that, that live there. So in general, research would tell us, and this is, this is, I love this picture, okay, these are grass and shrub types over here with the yellows and browns and forest and woodland types with the greens and blues and purples, okay, and that basically says how often should these things bur burn derived on the soils? What's the soil history? So this isn't, you know, going back to settler accounts, this is the actual what the soil properties and stuff like that are telling us based on the history, the soil evolution, stuff like that. We'd say this driftless area probably sees mixed severity fires on a 500 plus year interval, okay? The entire ecosystem is fire dependent, okay? But that's not necessarily in our lifetime. So it's a 500 year cycle. Now, that's because we are in very dense, you know, uh, woodland sorts of situations, hardwood situations, they just don't burn that frequently. Okay, probably understory, they burn more frequently, okay? <clears throat> so, let's talk about fire regime. Fire regimes, right? What we mostly are gonna be relying on to maintain the systems that we manage, okay, is understory fire regimes. Ground level fires that don't really knock down the standing vegetation. Now, if you have grass, if you have a CRP seed and you go out and burn that, what is that? That's actually a stand replacing fire because the stand is only grass that tall. If you have 250 or 300 year oak, you don't want to stand replacing fire in that. Okay? I've actually been on one of those in Missouri where they had, in the Ozarks, where they had a stand replacing oak fire in the middle of June. Um, it was 107 degrees and 7% of humidity at 11 at night. And a fire blew up through there and it killed about six or 700 acres of oak. Okay? And that is a stand replacing fire in the middle of June in Missouri, which should be wet. Right? So, so understory fire regimes are those that don't affect primary biome vegetation versus mixed severity, 
which you're getting ground level and canopy level. Some of them gets up and it, some of it takes out. And this is the kind of stuff that you might see in like Michigan or northern Wisconsin or stuff like that, where you maybe have a jack fire or a jack pine fire so, sort of thing, where you need some of those things to, gener to regenerate the tree and regenerate your forest resource. Um, but they're kind of taking out pockets and stuff like that. But, but in general, the, the stand of what is, is there is surviving, okay? Versus stand replacing fire. And like I said, that CRP burn might be a stand replacing fire because we're taking it all out and it's growing back. It's just it regrows in about three or four weeks, okay? Versus some things like out here where it's three or 400 years to regrow the stand. So, okay. And this is something because I was just a little bit further behind, but Wisconsin, Illinois, and Minnesota, they use ecological site descriptions. And this is stuff you guys might not ever get into. But this kind of tells us when a fire should be coming through, okay? This gives us a little bit more of a, of a when the fire should come through. In that, we have things that, and, and getting the, you get into science and academia and stuff like that, and you'll talk about fancy things called state and transition models. And basically that means at what point does that community kind of tip into a new ecosystem where the processes change? Okay, and a good example is that red cedar thing again. At some point, you'll be going along and it's a nice, you know, oak hickory woodland or it's a nice kind of broken savanna sort of situation. And you'll get some cedars growing and then some more cedars growing. And right, you burn it and it comes back and it's still a nice oak, oak savanna and stuff like that. But at some point, you'll get enough cedar in there that fire is no longer effective. And you go over some sort of cliff and that come, crosses that state and transition where at that point, it takes a serious process to go back and clean that back up. Okay, we're not talking like fire where it's like you know, a couple dollars an acre sort of thing. We're talking D6 cats at $700 an acre to get those things out. These ecological site descriptions might suggest where we should probably be at um, with our fire timing and those sorts of things to keep those other processes out so that we keep our woodlands the way we want them or our prairies the way we want them. Um, and by and large, these things, I mean, these, get, these are really academic sort of things, but by and large, those of you who are burning on three, four, five, six year intervals are probably hitting this for Northeast Iowa and Southwest Wisconsin, okay? You're probably hitting that, that you've got that understory fire regime, right? Now I'm going to start tying concepts. That understory fire regime is kind of going, it's maintaining, it's keeping the brush in the woods and stuff like that back. Maybe it's cooking those cedars off before they get a chance to establish, right? The endocrinology, I talked a little bit about that. This is just, I should have put this slide about three slides earlier, sorry. Um, this is actually from Iowa. This is Southwest Iowa and stuff like that. But this is really interesting right here. So this is, what, what this is, this is fire scars on an oak. This is a, well, it goes back to like 1649, I think, um, through just past 2000. So that, that oak was 350, 360 years old when it went down. And so they cored it out and they tried to figure out, and there's fire scars all over these. We'll see a picture of a fire scar in a little bit. Um, there's fire scars all over these things. That's what all these little check marks are there. And those fire scars actually indicate what direction the fire came from, what time of year it came from, and so forth. And they can go back and they can plot that out. And they've done this all over the United States. I mean, this is Wisconsin and Michigan and Arizona and all over the place. They can do this with trees all over the place. It's really pretty fascinating. What is this big blob right here? Anybody know what, all those fires hit every year, you know, all there's a big cluster of fires there around 1850. Settlement. Settlement. Perfect. We used fire a lot when we settled the land, right? We burned it off and cleared it and get the plows out there and clear the brush and stuff like that. We used fire a lot. And then post 1900, we virtually dropped off. Okay. How many people are from Wisconsin? Okay. How many people from Iowa? How many people from Illinois? Okay. Good. So we have all three represented. The Great Peshtigo Fire was one of the things that changed why we use fire. Anybody ever heard of the Great Peshtigo Fire? Good. We have. Why don't we hear about it very often? What happened on the same day? The Chicago Fire, I knew I had Illinois people in here and stuff like that. The Great Chicago Fire, Mrs. O'Leary's cow, right? Because that blazed and it blew up and a couple hundred people died. The Great Peshtigo people Fire, a couple thousand people died, right? A couple thousand people died up in northern, they don't even know how many. The range, estimates range from like 400 to 2,600 people died, but they don't even know because it was so big and so, such a conflagration that it just people just disappeared. And they have no idea, right? That was the same day in northern Wisconsin. That was one of the big events. There's about four or five seminal fire events in U.S. history that just made us quit using fire. We used it all the time prior to 1900. And after about 1900, 1910, we had four or five big things, and we just quit using it. And ever since then, it's been suppressed, 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 right? So anyways, we know that we use fire a lot, you know, um, the prairies and stuff like that. 
uh, Native Americans, um, Francis Shadron at Fort Clark, Dakota Territory, having nothing better to do, I set fire to the prairie. That's my day some days, although usually I'm sitting in front of a computer screen I don't get to. But And so we start to talk about novel ecosystems and what they look like. Well, here's a picture from Iowa's Lust Hills, 100 years apart, 1905 and 2005. This was fire, this was grazing, this was agriculture on the land, and this is not. This is after we turned it into a preserve. Those are not the same systems, right? Those are not the same systems anymore. Those are kind of, those are drastically different systems. Up here you can sit and you can see for miles across the Missouri Valley. Now you're in a choked up kind of brushy scrub forest. And that is simply the difference between fire and no fire, right? Smokey helped us with that. All right, so let's talk a little bit about fire governance here. So when we start burning, okay? I gotta do back-to-back -back talk, so I gotta keep myself going here talking for two hours straight. Um, so if we look at fire protection districts and stuff like that, if you're burning in Wisconsin, you will likely in this area probably need a permit to burn. Okay, you're right across from Iowa here. So right over here, Grant and Crawford and stuff like that in that area. You will need a permit to probably burn that day if you're going to plan on going out and you're trying to burn your property or something like that. And interestingly, Wisconsin kind of matches with their land cover. So if you look at this map of Wisconsin land cover versus Wisconsin permitting, right? So we see up here, this dense green basically is all our forests. Forests, forests, forests. So their permitting process kind of follows where the hazardous fuels are, where the forests are, and so forth. Um, and so you can get this stuff. You can go online and you can find out how you know where you need to permit and stuff like that. You can look what days are good for burning. Um, this is last night, so basically we're in low fire danger statewide, so you shouldn't have any problem if you want to go out this week and get a permit. Shouldn't. Okay. I don't work for I, I work for Iowa, not Wisconsin. Okay, um, but you shouldn't have any problem going out and getting a, a permit to go out and burn if you want to. Okay, most states will put some sort of um, put some sort of map up like this where it's interactive and you can go and you can find out if you need that permit to go burn. Okay, <clears throat> Minnesota right now. Okay, their restrictions are based on a number of different factors and stuff like that. So if we come down here to Southwest Wisconsin, or uh, excuse me, Southeast Minnesota, right? So over here along the river and stuff like that. Right now we do have have a burning permit required. It's dried out just enough that we do require some burning permits over there. Okay, these are based on a lot of different factors. Weather, the wind situations, um, that are the wind, the wind patterns that are present, the capacity of local resources, are the VFDs all stretched out right now? Um, that sort of thing. You know, what are the drought situations? So basically Minnesota's in no fire danger, but they have started to consider permitting right along there, kind of along the middle Minnesota thing. So Iowa's a different story, okay? Um, so Iowa, just because we're different. <laughs> so in Minnesota and Wisconsin, most of the states around us, the governor and the fire marshal, the state fire marshal, have the authority to close and issue burn permit restrictions and stuff like that. In Iowa, the governor cannot do that. The governor cannot say, you can't burn in Franklin County, Iowa today. She has no authority to do that. State fire marshal has no authority to do that. Iowa is 100% governed by the local fire chiefs of the county, by the VFDs of the county. And so, it may be raining to beat heavens for two weeks straight, and the fire chiefs, because they don't want to come in and have their guys come in, maybe everybody's on vacation for a month, they can just get together and they can vote for a burn ban and you can't burn. Okay, so it is completely local control. So, you know, I live in Franklin County over here, and so what will happen is that the chiefs of all the local VFDs in the county will have a conference call, if it's, especially if it's a dry time of year and stuff like that, obviously. But if it's a dry time of year, they'll have a conference call once a week, and they'll decide whether or not they should enact a burn ban. And if they choose to enact a burn ban, then that county is burn ban. Okay? They can permit you to do it if you can prove that you have a lot of resources and everything else. You can get a special permit at that. But in general, you won't. So, And then it's not lifted until they vote to take it off. So the governor has no authority, and, and, and the state fire marshal has no authority. So it's completely localized. And so when we get later into this spring, in about a month, this map will be kind of checkered if it gets really dry. Um, you know, they might be, it might be banned up here, but good to go over there. And so there's no kind of regional or whatever. It's county by county in Iowa. So in Iowa, and I assume some other states, always call the emergency authorities. Everywhere you go, and just wherever you are, you always, always, always call the sheriff's office and say, I'm going to burn today or tomorrow or whatever. Okay, let them know when you're going to do it. In Iowa, which I'm most familiar with, right, they are required by law to respond if a fire is called in, okay? And I promise you, if you go out and you have a campfire in your backyard, somebody is calling the fire department. 
It happens nonstop. You would not believe how many fire calls they get because somebody saw smoke in somebody's backyard and panicked and said, oh my God, 1300 Elm Street's burning down. And it's somebody having a campfire and drinking a beer in their backyard. That stuff gets called in. Now, most of that stuff they don't go respond to, but if you're out there and you're burning your ditch off because you just want to burn that off, or you're burning your garden off. I burned my garden off and actually had it called in before. You know, I let the deputies know that I was going to do that. I burned my garden off, which was half the size of this room, and that got called in as a raging wildfire. Because people panic. People panic when they see fire. And so make sure you call in. Because in Iowa, the counties actually do have the right to bill you. Okay? And so you know, when they send the trucks, they can bill you for whatever they send out. They don't always do it, but the emergency management authorities of every county do have the right to do that, and the county supervisors can bill you. I do know of a case in southern Iowa. Somebody burned down, he thought burned down an old building in the middle of 700 acres of CRP, which didn't seem very smart. He didn't call it in. They responded with seven trucks and an ambulance, $400 per fire truck and 800 for the ambulance. Okay, so that's very quickly a $4,000 bill because he just didn't bother to call. Um, and they, they have that authority. So always notify the emergency authorities when you're going to go out and burn, okay? I assume so, but I do not know. Her question was, can they bill you in other states? My assumption is yes, because that's kind of the way that policy is progressing for most states. Um, but I can't say for sure, because I don't work a lot with other states, and what I do, I'm on an official capacity, so. No, no. So her question is good. And I should clarify that. If you call it in, and her question is, if you call it in, do they have to come? No. And that's why you do call in. I'm sorry. I should have clarified that more. Um, and I got, just kind of glossed over it. Yeah. <laughs> well, then you're calling back and asking for help. But yes, if you call in, then somebody says, oh my God, the whole world's on fire. And they say, nope, where are you at? No, it's been called in. We know about it. You're fine. Okay. And so then they won't, re they won't send out people. Okay. So good question. If you call in, they will not respond to it unless you call back. Being like, oh my God, I lost this. Then they'll come back out for you. Yep. So, depending on your jurisdiction, burning re permit re may require a prescribed burn plan. Okay. Has anybody ever written one? Has anybody tried to develop a burn plan? Or when you're out there drinking your coffee, you just light the match and go. We have a couple couple people have written a burn plan. Good. Good. And you know, it's the forethought that you put into it when you start thinking about it that helps you. Because then I'm going to guarantee you. We talk about in, when I do a little bit more professionally and stuff. We talk about the Swiss cheese model. Every time you burn, something will go wrong. Every single time. I've been on, I don't know, just shy of three or four hundred wild or prescribed fires and just shy of 30 wildfires. Every single one had something go wrong at some point. And it could be a little thing or it could be a big thing. A pump failing is a big thing, right? The radio doesn't work and the batteries die is a little thing. But every single one, somebody twists an ankle. God dang it. Every single fire I've ever been on, something will go wrong. When you have the plan, it's much more easy to pull out. Okay, that went wrong. Here's what I'm doing. Or, hey, I know where everybody is on this plan and stuff like that. I know what's going on. Okay? Stuff will go wrong when you're dealing with fire. It's just kind of Murphy's Law there. You may be required to, depending on state requirements for that burn permit. Iowa does not um, in general. Um, but if you're trying to, like if the county has a burn ban on and you're trying to justify you still want to burn, you may need to have a very good plan to try and justify them and give you an exemption to that. Uh, USDA over there puts that one out. That's a very good, just basic kind of burn program. Um, this one's from Oklahoma State Extension. This is from Iowa State Extension. These are all online. Um, you can get these documents and print them out and there'll be about six or, this one's really, this one's the most thorough, that one's probably a little less thorough, of just what you need to do, and they'll walk you through all the different planning parts of that and stuff like that, okay? All right, so let's talk about fire in the woods, okay? Fire in the woods, so what are, what common goals do we have for fire in the woods? Anybody? Oak restoration, invasive species. Get rid of maples, I like that one. That's a good one. Maple is very fire intolerant. Yep. Have fun. Hey, that's a good one. Recreational burning, right? Something to do on a Sunday. Okay. Well, removing downed and woody debris, invasive species, brush, habitat, improvement of habitat. Anybody hunt turkeys? Hunt turkeys two weeks after, or a week after you burn. Turkey will suck to a burn scar like nobody's business. Okay. Hunt turkeys on the burn. Um, regeneration of woodies, uh, oak species and stuff like that. You guys mentioned that. Future fire danger. We can clean the woods up. Okay. Um, and then even this maintenance of seral stages, there's a little bit more of an academic term again, but that's what you're talking about with like maples and stuff like that. You prevent it from going to that next community, and that maple is actually the climax community over and above oak, 
So, okay. So we think about fire, maybe we're trying to keep our parklands and stuff like that. Maybe we're trying to keep it a little bit more open, a little bit more park-like atmosphere. Okay, so we maybe we're doing this kind of annual or biannual or triannual sort of uh, maintenance burning. So we keep it open. We've kept the woody species down. We're keeping forest flowers going, stuff like that. Okay, be careful of jackpotting. Be careful of jackpotting. This pile of brush and stuff like that between two old red oaks? Hard, hard, hard to tell in that picture. Two old oaks or whatever. You're going to fire scar that and you're going to cat face both those trees. Both those trees will be severely damaged if you're ever thinking of like timber value or anything like that down the road. So be very careful using fire there. Okay. When you look at woodland um, leaf litter, you know, by and large, and we'll talk about this in a second, by and large, our fires should probably happen in the fall, right? They should probably happen in the fall when we generate leaf litter, so that, that stuff to burn. And if you actually go out, when you go through and you walk through an oak forest, in the fall, in November, what are you doing? It's all kind of truffling, right? It's big and fluffy and you, you kick big balls of leaves around and it's kind of fluffy, right? Oak leaf litter is very, very fire adapted. It's, they curl up, the edges of the leaves curl up. There's lots of air pockets. There's lots of air in that leaf litter and stuff like that. The leaf litter itself is adapted for fire, to spread fire, okay? Versus maple leaf litter, what happens when you out with maples? You end up with kind of a flat, you know, anti-pyric, it tends to trap moisture and hold moisture. It doesn't dry out very well. After a rain, an oak litter, you know, oak leaf litter will dry out in a day or two. A maple leaf litter won't, right? It gets very, very soggy. It's very anti-pyric and it prevents fire spread. Okay, so kind of pay attention to what kind of woodland you have, okay? Now, sometimes it can be tough to generate enough um, kind of cast or mass cast, you know, from, from the from that year's growth and so forth to be able to burn every year, but certainly on a biennial basis, you're probably generating enough oak leaf litter that you can burn almost every other year if you wanted to. Okay, so you gotta know the composition. In general, our maples are extremely fire intolerant. Okay, and that's what this gentleman pointed out over here. Maple is extremely fire intolerant, okay? Oaks are very, very fire tolerant. Hickories can be in between and stuff like that. Hickory and walnut can kind of be in between. You gotta pay attention to hickory bark because if you, especially like a shag bark, Right? You can actually get heat up the inside and you can scar the tree a little bit. But in our woods, we tend to need to burn with lower RHs, relative humidities. And again, I'm talking to a crowd that's done a little bit of fire, so I'm not going to hit that stuff real hard. Okay, But you may, de may need to burn your woods on a day with 25 or 30% humidity, which is a day you would not even think about burning grassland. Okay? You may burn on it with higher winds because down in the oak timber, we have a reduction factor of about 0.1. So a 20 mile an hour wind out in the open is probably a two to three mile an hour wind down in, if you're down in the timber and stuff like that. The effective wind speed is very different. Okay, so you burn on a drier day, a little bit windier day, a little bit more sun because you want the sun getting down through that radiant heat, okay? Burn the fall versus, uh, excuse me, burn in the fall versus spring because you have that litter cast. You can burn your woodlands in the spring, but it's harder because you got that overwinter moisture and stuff like that, it becomes much more difficult to burn the, the timbers in the spring than they do in the fall, okay? And this is a big one for me. You want to burn when your target species, so those invasive species, those things you're trying to keep out, are the most susceptible to fire, and that's any process. I mean, that's, that's mowing, that's chemical, that's, that's fire, that's any of those things. Burn when they're most susceptible to fire impacts, and by and large, most of your woodland invasives are most susceptible to fire impacts in September, October, and November, okay? They're pulling resources down. You know, those things like bush honeysuckle, well, I'll say green into November. Um, but those trees are actually pulling, the, those things are pulling the resources down and storing carbohydrates in those root reserves for the winter to get through the winter. If when they're pulling that down and you smack them with a good fire, you can actively damage the, what, what they're trying to do. Okay, you'll actively damage what they're trying to do. Okay? Um, just, by, just by damaging the cambium, the xylem and phloem and stuff like that, they won't get that same exchange down there that will pucker in with the fire and stuff like that. And they can't sink those reserves in and that tree is that much weaker than the next spring. Okay? Fire moving uphill. How does fire work? Slides up. It is always the uphill face of the tree. So if the fire is coming this direction, it is the uphill face of the tree that will take the most damage. So be cognizant of that when you're out burning. Right? Sometimes we start our, our, if we have a little ridge, if we can, and the conditions allow, we start our fire at the top of the ridge and let it back down rather than at the bottom of the ridge and sweep up. Because as that fire comes up, you get a funneling effect of heat and the back side of that tree is actually more damaged than the front side of the tree. And that's the side you'll end up with the cat face on. 
So if you have the ability to do so, and your prescription allows you to do so, try and backfire down. You have two things you're kind of worried about here. Um, the first of which is kind of residence time. Re uh, yeah, the first is residence time. We'll go with that. Okay, so the residence time right here is the amount of time the fire spends on any one given inch or foot or whatever of ground. Okay, now you can run a head fire through there and watch it sweep by, and that residence time may be six or seven seconds. Okay, or you can back a fire down, and that residence time may be 30 or 40 seconds. But that funneling effect right here from that intense fire going up will probably have more heat impact on that six or seven seconds that's sweeping by than that fire that kind of creeps down is only about that tall and tends to only and tends to last 30 or 40 seconds. So you want to monitor your residence time there. And the other is just the sweeping factor, right? That intensity factor. So residence time is one thing, but then fire intensity is the other. Okay? That, um, that backfire, and we'll see a picture here in a minute, that backfire is going to have much lower intensity. It's going to be thinner, wispier, and stuff like that. The combustion will be more complete than the head fire will. The head fire will be very intense, put off a lot of heat, crank out BTUs, may not get everything burned down to the ground but it'll sweep up there and be far more impactful on some of this vegetation than will a backing fire. Quick question. Mm -mm. Probably not. So his question was, my slide here, it's, just, it's the pictures that they have for PowerPoint. <laughs> so his slide here, he, his point was, my slide shows leaves on the trees and stuff like that. Does the heat and the smoke kill the trees? Um, or kill the leaves and stuff like that? In general, you might get a curling effect. But you'll be surprised how by the time you get about 20 or 30 feet up that the heat impacts actually mitigate pretty intensely unless you're really ripping a fire through there and stuff like that. No, okay, so his question is like smoke actually plugging like the, the oh, the, yeah, the, the holes, the ventrioles and stuff like that on the leaves and stuff like that. What's that? Stomata, yeah, thank you. I'm a, I'm a wildlife guy, I'm not a forester. <laughs> Um, no, that actually isn't that much of a problem. We don't really run into that very much. I mean, there's some stuff that's been out there, but we don't really see that kind of impact that you might think you might, uh, or that, that sort of intense impact that you might think you, you would from smoke and stuff like that. And that can be varied when you're smoke management because it's, it's the size of your particulate matter that you're throwing. And so like a head fire will throw very thick artic or particulate matter into the air, and that's why it's big and billowing and black, versus a backing fire, which is a longer residence time, which will have very thin and wispy sort of smoke. And so it's much easier to work in. It's much less impactful on things around it. But I don't know. I don't think it would ever pro be a problem for like the stomata and stuff like that. So, but anyways, good question. That's an interesting one. Okay, we hit that. So this is what you get, end up with then. You end up with that cat face log. So if you're out there and you're thinking about timber value one day or something like that, these are the these are fire scars on the uphill side of that tree. Okay, so that fire when this when that fire hit, it hit from the left side there and it curled around and that's the heat impacts. Red oak will cat face very very bad. White oaks will not so much. White oaks tend to compartmentalize damage and red oaks can just kind of grow around it and so you get a cat face out of a, out of a red oak um, versus a white oak. Not that the fire scar won't be in a white white oak, it still can be and it can damage the log value after that. But generally, that funneling kind of hits the back side of the tree like that. So, okay, when we're burning our grasslands, okay, you know, well, a lot of cases, fire is required so that a grassland stays a grassland. That's why grasslands are grassland, um, is because they've got fire on them, okay? If you have CRP, very often it's a, it's a frequent, it's a cheap, it's an easy way to do your mid-contract maintenance uh, when you got to do that um, in years five and six of the contract. Invigorate hair habitat growth. If you walk through that same sort of thing with like a, a thick old dead stand of, of canary grass as a pain in the butt to walk through in the summer, the same thing. After five or six years, your, your, your big blue stem prairies and your switchgrass prairies and stuff like that will get very stagnant and very dead and very grass dominated and stuff like that. So we use fire to set that back, okay? Um, wildfire risk reduction, we don't deal with that a lot in this part of the world. Undesirable plants, but a bigger one that's starting to come up now is actually improvement of grazing and forage resources, okay? And so we burn off in the spring, and sometimes we burn midsummer. If you're in a different part of the world, we might try and burn midsummer as a way to promote cattle browse, as a way to promote goat browse, as a way to promote those different things like that. Um, forb growth. Forb growth will be very dependent on when you burn. I think that's my next slide. Okay. Our C4 plants tend to erupt very early in the growing season. Okay. So we want to burn probably, in our, you know, we burn um, November to March to try and get rid of, or to try and push our C4s versus our C3s, which we might want to burn in the spring, right? So our C3 cool season grasses, brome grass, reed canary grass, um, actually your wild rye are C3 grasses, 
Um, but they are a native C3. Your sedges are C3 grasses. So all the C3s, those are all in the graminoid family. Um, those are all cool seasons. If you start to burn, when this picture was taken in May, a fire can drastically set back um, those C3 growing plants. So if you want to push your natives a little bit more and knock your cool seasons back, burn later in the spring, okay? Or alternatively, burn in September, okay? When they get that second pulse of growth going again. Your C4 grasses are all your, your big blue stems, your, your switch grasses, your, your, your June grasses and stuff like that. All those, actually June grass might be a C3, but basically your big prairie grasses and stuff like that are all your C4 plants, okay? And so if you burn in that kind of March, November dormant time frame, you're really going to kick them up, but you also kick these, okay? If you burn in May, you're not going to hit these, but you're going to hit the C3s pretty hard, okay? If that's your goal is to kind of knock your brome grass back and bump your big blue stem, try and burn in May, okay? Now, that fire in May is going to be a pain in the butt if you're burning C3 grasses and stuff like that because it's green, it's smokier, there's a lot more, um, there's a lot more, uh, moisture in the smoke and stuff like that. It's much more volatile. Those sorts of things are going to be much more irritating to your respiratory system when you're out there trying to burn. Okay? Our forbs and our flowers tend to benefit the most from a late growing season burn. August and September. Okay? August and September. Because the grasses are still pretty much actively growing, but almost all your flowers and forbs have tended to senesce by then. Okay? So all that stuff is basically senesced. So they, they've gone through their seed cycle, they produce their seed, they're growing and stuff like that, and they've already died for the year. But by August and September, your grasses are still growing. So you burn in August, September, October, you can knock your grasses back and really boost your flower components out of your seeding. All right, wetlands. You know, we don't burn in wetlands as much, primarily because you, you really kind of need to be in a drought cycle and stuff like that, but it's very important. If anybody ever gets like, if you've got a pond or a wetland or something like that, it really starts to get cattail choked. Sometimes we burn those in the middle of winter. Okay, if we have a, no, a very low snow winter, we'll burn off right over the ice because then the next year when that melts and stuff like that, the water will come back up and it'll actually drown some of your cattails out. You can actually open your wetland or your pond or things like that back up. So we do burn off over the ice. Um, you know, I've got up here the hemi-marsh cycle. So if in, you know, in, in marsh or wetland dynamics and stuff like that, we talk about a hemi-marsh cycle, which is kind of half vegetation and half open. And it's good for waterfowl and, and, and water birds and different wildlife and stuff like that. Um, sometimes it's reliant upon that. We got to get a drought year and we got to get in there. We got to burn some of that vegetation down. So and we need drought years like 2012, 2013 to really get into some of those things. Or we perhaps look at a low snow winter when we've got, when it freezes up and we can burn off over the ice. We do that about, I do that about once every three or four years. We'll actually try and burn something off over the ice and we're just trying to burn those cattails clean down. So, uh, simulating growth, the wetland cycle and stuff like that. Um, you know, again, it does need to kind of be during those dry cycles or drought conditions, um, but we do. We try and open up those choke systems when they kind of get choked in with vegetation and stuff like that. So, all right. Wildlife habitats, um, regardless of your goals, hopefully you're thinking about the wildlife that are out there um, and stuff like that. But, you know, they're not necessarily, they don't have to be the driving goal of the fire, but very often they are, okay? We want to promote regrowth in a lot of cases. We try and drive the production of winter cover, diversity, uh, diversifier covers, get more forbs and stuff like that for seed and insect production, okay? Enhancing food resources for young wildlife. But we want to be careful that we take care of those trade-offs, right? That we always want some sort of refugia for the wildlife that are out there. If, you're, if your habitat, if your 40 acres is the only 40 acres that critters got to get into in that whole landscape, don't burn the whole 40, you know? Burn, cut it in half and burn parts like that so that we maybe get 20 acres refugia and stuff like that. It's, it's remarkable when you go out and burn, um, you know, we'll get a big fire going, all the pheasants wait until the fire is just about on them to kind of take off. So, you know, you get a big eruption of pheasants out of the middle of it. So, um, if you ever burn around bison, they just don't care. They're like, hey, we've been around fire for 10,000 years. Um, but bison are kind of neat because you'll burn right up to them and they'll just lay there until the fire's literally on their butt. And then they'll get up and then you got to just make sure you're clear of the smoke because the thundering herd just comes out of nowhere. So, but... It's interesting. So always provide for refugia when you're trying to think about wildlife benefits and that. So uh, forage production. I mentioned this just a few minutes ago. Um, diversifying forage base. We start to see this come out of the Great Plains. They're seeing more and more of it in Iowa. We as a state are starting to do this a lot more. Um, as the Iowa DNR, we are probably up to about six or 7,000 acres or more that we are grazing now that we burn first, then we graze. Try and get some different habitat effects. Okay, there are prairie flowers that only occur at the intersection of fire and grazing. You know, they have to have two processes to kind of kick them into their growth form. And so we're trying to do some really light conservation grazing where we'll go and we'll burn, get the cattle back out there, and then pull them off. 
and we get some different flowers and some different habitats kind of evolving with that. Okay, um, the big thing here is that you can increase palatability and you can improve the nutritional content. That's, that's kind of the big reason why you go ahead and, and burn for your grazing operations is that we basically take everything to the point that plants develop um, herbivory defense mechanisms and stuff like that. So that at some point they become unpalatable, they become, they've got physical things like thorns and spines and stuff like that. They've got chemical, they've got tannins and uh, um, um, some other chemicals and stuff like that that make them more unpalatable. Okay, but when we burn it, it sets everything back and it kind of wipes the slate clean, wipes the slate clean, and then everything becomes nutritious and palatable in that early growth stage. So we can really focus our grazing efforts on that, hammer some things that we use to hammer invasive species sometimes too. Get those invasive species set back, they start growing, then we dump cattle on them and really graze them into the ground. We get our prairie to express itself after that, right? Oh, so there's just a pasture, you know, there's a pasture, prairie pasture that we burn. You know, everybody else was, it's all brown around it. That's the day we burned. Two weeks later, we are grazing and no one else was because we green up that faster. So we can change our grazing season as well. So we can actually improve or, or slide up the time in which we get animals out there. So, all right. So timing of fire, okay? First and foremost, you should be able to one, do it safely and two, achieve your goals, right? I mean, just burning in April because I should burn in April doesn't necessarily get me anywhere if I've got some certain goals, right? Maybe my goal is trying to set back maple succession and stuff like that. Burning in April might not get me there. Burning in August will. Burning in September will when that leaf, or sorry, a little later, September, October might, because now that leaf litter is down and now those trees are starting to pull resources, my fire might be more effective. So just because you can burn in April doesn't mean you should if that's your goal, depending on what your goals are, okay? Practical restraints can keep us from doing our burning at the right time of year when it likely historically occurred, namely in Iowa. August, September, October, when we should probably be out there burning, a lot of corn on the ground, right? And that's millions and millions of dollars sitting there sometimes right next to what we want to burn, and it's just not worth the risk, okay? It just might not be worth the risk in that sort of situation, okay? Historically, we probably looked at 80 to 90% of our fires. If we go back and we look at those tree ring data and stuff like that, 80 to 90% of our fire probably happened in August, September, October, okay? The way we burn, and we as agencies are perfectly guilty of it, because really, a lot of times we're not doing much in March, so whatever, March and April, it's like, go set out, you know, we'll go set stuff on fire because we're not doing much else. Well, so we've kind of changed the paradigm there, that we're about to 90% now of our fires in the spring, when we probably should be at about 80, 20, or 90, 10, but we're really more like, you know, we're really burning about 90% of our stuff right now in the spring, about this time of year, okay? Okay? Weather, I mean, you guys are pretty good with weather, um, but in general, we prefer, just real quickly, um, we, we, we want to avoid our bluebird days. And you guys are probably pretty good with that and stuff like that by now. Um, but we want to avoid those high pressure days, those light and variable wind days, and stuff like that with high winds and low humidities. It's actually far better when we have a kind of a low pressure system has just passed, we got light and puffy clouds going on, um, you know, steady and moderate direction winds. We know that wind is coming out of the northwest all day long versus that wind is just light and variable and it's two to three miles an hour to the north and then three miles an hour to the east and then two miles. So when you got a 50 yard fire, fire line, you know, 50 yards that way and 50 yards that way, and your winds are only at three miles an hour, but when they come from the north, you got to run over there. When they come from the west, you got to run over here. Very quickly, even though it's a very nice, light, nice weather day, it becomes a lot of running to try and just keep back where your fire is going all the time versus that wind is eight miles an hour out of the northwest. It's always going to be that direction. I can plan and I can burn more accordingly. Okay. <clears throat> Red flag days. I just put this in here because always it's, it's kind of a staple reminder that I give people. Never burn on a red flag day. That is a day that you will lose that fire. Conditions are so bad and so volatile. Okay. It's so dry and so windy or so droughty that that will, that fire will get away from you. Okay. And this is the one case where your liability insurance stuff might not cover you because if there's a red flag day, that becomes a gross negligent situation if you go out and you light a fire. Okay. That becomes a gross negligent situation. Basically that a reasonable person would understand that stuff is going to get out of hand today if I light it on fire. Okay. And so most of those days that you should never burn on that red flag day. Okay. Um, Smoke sensitive areas, and this is, this is interesting more for the picture than for the words on the side there, but you know, the smoke sensitive areas, right here we have the backfire. 
The back fire produces very thin, wispy smoke, but the combustion is much more complete versus this head fire over the hill coming up back here, which is thick and rank and so forth because that fire is whipping, it's ripping up through there. Very intense. It's throwing off a lot of particulate matter. It's much bigger particulate matter than this back fire right here where this smoke is very thin and wispy and stuff like that. It's more complete combustion, but it's a much thinner smoke. So, um, but you know, roads, occupied buildings, airports, watersheds, air sheds, managed ventilation systems. A lot of us live near some sort of managed ventilation system on a hog confinement or something else like that, okay? If a hog confinement gets smoke into it, okay, in a managed ventilation system like that, none of those pigs are allowed to enter the human food chain. So even if the pigs all survive, if you dump smoke into a, into a confined animal feeding operation, none of those pigs can enter the human food chain. If you've got 2,498 pigs, go right under the, right under the matrix cutoff, right? If you've got 2,498 pigs that you can't put into the food chain, that's a lot of money for that farmer. So be careful around managed ventilation systems. So you can plan for all this, for wind, for moisture, for soils and stuff like that, for smoke. Okay, pay attention to your winds with smoke management. And we've got a nice publication out there, uh, also out there online. Okay, you notify your neighbors, just be neighborly. Let them know you're gonna be out there burning and so forth when you go to do it. So, hmm, 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 hmm. I'm gonna go through a couple of these things because she said I got less than 10 minutes left. So, but one thing I wanna get to right here and this is something that's starting to grow. And I want to encourage folks, and this is, I've kind of had this thought here, is there's things called prescribed fire cooperatives, and they're especially popular down in the south. Um, as you can see, like, most of Oklahoma's in one now. This is even outdated. There's a couple more in Texas. They're up in Nebraska pretty big. But this is where landowners like yourselves start to unite. And you say, you know what, I got 30 acres, but it's just me. It's hard to burn that. But maybe they've got 40, and maybe he's got 60. And now three or four or five of you are getting together and say, you know what, Maybe if we get together and we start to burn these things, a lot of these things are organized as 501c3s and the government really likes those right now and they will give you fire equipment. Rangers, pumps, tanks, tools, clothing, gear, and stuff like that. And I, it, it takes a really, there are two loose ones in Iowa that aren't on this map. Um, and it takes kind of a, it, I mean, it does, it takes kind of a, a landowner or a couple landowners are willing to kind of step up, but then they find, kind of form this group where there's maybe six or eight of them or more, some of these things are huge with hundreds of members, and you maybe you pay some dues and you help yourselves out and stuff like that and you can buy some equipment, but then everybody takes turn burning each other's property. And that way you always know each other. You start to get uh, you know, that kind of, excuse me, that more of a network and stuff like that where you can get out and you can help each other burn each other's property. You kind of become practitioners in a little bit more of a sense. So, um, and stuff like that. It's something that seems to me that up here, you have to have the right landscape to make these things work. Um, we've seen them try to start in western Iowa, and they haven't gone real well, but this, is, this sort of landscape up here in this driftless area kind of makes me think it, it could work up there. So these rise of these cooperatives are really starting to present new opportunities to get more fire on the landscape, battle, battle invasive species, and stuff like that. So, all right, well, you guys just being here, I mean, you're starting to think about your fire in the weeks and months ahead of when you might do it, okay? And, and so you're a leg up already. You're already thinking about it. A bunch of you have done it. Okay, you're starting to think about these things. You know, you're putting forethought into why that fire is appropriate. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Maybe other practices are more appropriate. Um, you know, your goals, your timing and those sorts of things. Consider your jurisdictions and whatnot, okay? Smoke management. These are the things you should be hitting on in the days and weeks and months ahead of time, which by you guys being here, you're starting to think about. So, oof, she, she gave me the five about a minute ago, so I might have been losing it. So, so that's what I have. I mean, we tried to, we tried to cover a lot of stuff pretty quickly. Um, I am... Happy to take questions now, and I'll try and get them all recorded here. We are recording all this stuff to be kind of captured, so you can go back and you can listen to this recording here um, in about two weeks. I'll have them all up online. Right here. Really quickly, what do I think is develop? It's not. It's not. Really quickly, what do I think is hindering the development of fire cooperatives in Iowa? You have to have an economic underpinning to make it worthwhile. Um, it is tough, and you guys are mostly recreational landowners, or you got small wood lots and stuff like that. It's tough if you don't have an economic, some sort of economic underpinning. And this is, I think, is what's going on in Western Iowa. Underpinning. I think it's more of an underpinning. I don't think it's so much of an incentive because I think, I think most of the people in this room would, are, are happy to go out and burn without some sort of incentive or financial incentive to go burn. I mean, you're in here because you have land and you, you want to maintain your land and make it more healthy and stuff like that. The fire cooperatives that are successful have some sort of, be it grazing or be it, um, fire risk prevention or something like that. There's some sort of economic underpinning that tends to make the really successful ones really successful. They can tie it back to something. Okay, 
we're all going to get together, but all 30 of us are going to get together and we're going to burn 10 farms this year. And then we're going to burn 10 farms next year and 10 farms. And we all see then that we get a forage boost based out of that for a two or three year cycle for our grazing animals. Or it's a wildfire risk mitigation sort of thing. Okay, we're all going to get together. We're going to burn these 10 farms this year. And we know then that that has all been burned off and now it will come back green. We don't have, we've kind of mitigated that wildfire risk going into a dry year. So some of these that are, oh, I don't have the map up there. Some of them are more in like, there's, there's some in Mississippi and stuff like that. And I'd like to see those examples of what those are. But I really feel like it, the ones that are super successful have an economic underpinning of some sort, not an incentive, but an, but an underpinning there. So, yeah. So his question is, he's got a grassland and stuff like that. It's got lots of old gopher mounds. It's really rough and stuff like that. Does burning help? Burning is just taking the vegetation off. Um, you'd probably still want to go back and disc the gopher mounds down or something like that to try and get it there. Um, you know, gopher mounds are actually one way that we actually get bare soil and new plants get established um, and stuff like that. So, you know, the fire itself won't necessarily do anything for that. Um, you're not generating, you know, on a grass fire and stuff like that, you're not generating the kind of heat that would break down soil structure and make it more compactable or stuff like that. So, would it burn down through the roots enough and stuff like that? It's probably, it's a good first step just because it cleans it up. Um, in terms of like fire and heat and stuff like that, getting down below the soil into like a subsurface sort of thing, actually not. Um, the surprising thing is, is that in most grasslands, if you go one inch below the soil surface, when that fire runs across, the, the temperature goes up by two degrees. And so it is, it is really a non-factor in a subterranean level. So lots of your wildlife and stuff like that, if they can get underground, they can escape it. If they can get that far underground, that fire may rage above them for 10 minutes and it doesn't hurt them sort of thing. So we don't see a lot of root impacts that are anything more than indirect because, you know, if you have an indirect effect on the plant, like when it's actively growing and stuff like that, the root can die back and stuff like that. But we're not actually seeing like consumption of the root and stuff like that. Good question. Yeah, uh, our property, let's say, is the interstate. <laughs> Yep. Yep. So his question is, he's right up against the interstate, excuse me. Um, he's right up against the interstate and stuff like that. And that's what really adds to his discomfort because he's got that there. Is there anything we can do to call or stuff like that? In a big situation like that, four-lane U.S. highways, interstates and stuff like that, there's really not. I mean, certainly notify the authorities and make sure the smoke's going the other direction. The problem is rubberneckers, right? Everybody wants, when there's a fire going on, everybody's like, oh my God, there's a fire. And so it's hard to avoid that factor. If you've, if you've got a plan and you've managed your smoke and you're burning away from it and you've got resources there, if they have an accident, it's probably their fault, okay? You've probably mitigated it. It will make you, it would be 